can actually officially start. <clears throat> um, and um, we do hope that some other, some more people will find their way into our Zoom meeting, which is the last, not the, the last, before the last installment of the um, Southeast European Studies online research platform that uh, we launched this semester building on uh, a previous collaboration with the University of uh, Rijeka and the so-called Rijeka Regensburg lectures, which turned into a larger platform now involving also the Center for Advanced Studies in, in uh, Sofia. We have two distinguished speakers and um, uh, it is not accidentally, but also the result of a very, very strategic invitation policy. Now, it was really just by chance that actually their topics speak to each other very well, not only because they will speak about the socialist period, well, also about the socialist period, but uh, we will hear a lot about uh, repression, the policies of uh, politics of repression in Bulgaria, in Martin's case, and in uh, in uh, in uh, socialist Yugoslavia, in Edwin's in Edwin's case, and of course also more about how political institutions actually worked, how power was um organized so we have two speakers as uh, like uh, usual the first one is uh, martin uh, walkov from uh, the university of sofia clement ochritsky university of sofia where he is uh, uh, a docent uh, of uh, history at the uh, department of bulgarian history so he teaches modern bulgarian uh, history uh, martin has a phd from the University of uh, of Sofia, which uh, is now um, turning into a book, which is going to be a really very important book because this his, his dissertation was the first really uh, empirically based exploration of the occupational policies of uh, Bulgaria in uh, uh, Varda, Macedonia, Kosovo, southern Serbia, so parts of uh, 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 Serbia that were uh, occupied by Bulgaria in during World War World War One, and he is an eminent expert of uh, the Bulgarian dimension of uh, World War One, but also working on World War Two and the legacies of these war wars, also in terms of transitional uh, justice. Uh, for the last couple of months, uh, Martin has been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies, where he has another month to go and where he works on uh, on two projects. One is the one we will be hearing about in a minute, Beyond Totalitarianism, Mass Internment, Concentration Camps and Forced Labor in Bulgaria in the 20th century, which is, I think, really a pioneering project, also by bringing together uh, interwar and socialist, interwar, wartime and socialist uh, Bulgaria, and then uh, another project of uh, of of his that he's currently pursuing is uh, Victor's Justice or a Travesty of Justice: the persecute the prosecution of war crimes in Bulgaria after the First World War. Edwin Peso is a member of our institute in Regensburg, the Leibniz Institute for East and Southeast European Studies, which he joined uh, in 2010. Um, as the coordinator and main uh, and and uh, uh, editorial uh, or managing editor of one of our big or uh, gargantuan one would call it projects, which is the handbook of Southeast European uh, history. Uh, Wolfgang Höppen is smiling because he's also involved as an author in at least two volumes, and he knows that uh, this is a task which takes, I think, even longer than building the Chinese wall but ultimately it will be finished and then hopefully also in 3000 years still be used very much like you can visit the chinese wall um edwin has a phd from the university of uh, jena with um, a work that also came out as a book on the emigration of muslims from interwar yugoslavia in between like forced and voluntary uh, migration giving a very, very nuanced treatment of uh, of this very specific emigration movement of Muslims from Yugoslavia mainly to to Turkey and uh, in the last couple of years Edwin has taken the very ungrateful 
ungrateful but important task to write the biography of one of the most eminent and also most notorious uh, politicians of uh, socialist Yugoslavia, which is Alexander Rankovic, and he's going to present his book project. Uh, we will proceed as uh, it is stated in the program. So Martin goes, um, goes uh, first, as you know, you have 30 minutes. If you speak less, we have more time for discussion. And then after a, a brief discussion of Martin's paper, we will hear Edwin. And if there's still time at the end, we should finish at like half past three at latest. Then, uh, then we have a discussion of both, both presentations together. Martin, hi there. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Brumbauer. Thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, um, like really fascinating uh, uh, online lecture platform. Thank, uh, uh, thank everyone for uh, attending uh, my lecture. I will try to stick to the 30 minutes that I'm, that I'm allowed. I uh, hope now uh, night, uh, that um, my presentation is visible to everyone. That is, it has been shared. Can you see it? Okay, okay, then I'll start. Okay, uh, I'm <clears throat> sorry. As you can see, the title of my project is Beyond Totalitarianism. It's about uh, mass internment, mass civilian internment, concentration camps, and forced labor in Bulgaria in the 20th century. Um, uh, as the title suggests, uh, the, the whole idea of this project is to move beyond the totalitarian paradigm and uh, to, to look at the evolution and uh, what I can call mutation of, of uh, these uh, repressive policies and repressive institutions of uh, internment and camps and forced labor uh, in the 20th century. It's very much a national history, but trying to be uh, open and sensitive about the international context. Uh, it's um, very much inspired and informed by by the, uh, the recent trends in, in the study of uh, concentration camps, which developed in the last two decades, uh, and uh, which moved away from from, not, uh, from uh, the study of uh, the camps in Nazi Germany and uh, um, uh, the Gulag and concentrated first probably in the colonial camps of the late 19th and early 20th century and then the mass internment in, uh, in the First World War as really the starting point of the global proliferation of, of uh, internment and uh, camps. So, uh, it, it somehow it somehow uh, seems that uh, concentration camps on the one hand and totalitarianisms uh, on the other uh, were made for each other. That there is some intrinsic uh, connection between the two. Uh, some of the most uh, like prominent philosophers and social thinkers of the 20th century um, imply that or specifically stress that Hannah, uh, Hannah Arendt calls. Uh, calls uh, the camps uh, uh, like places for the eradication of man. Uh, Wolfgang Zowski sees them as uh, the laboratories of violence. Zygmunt Bauman uh, uh, argues that, that the camps are patterns and blueprints for totalitarian societies. And like a quote that I would like to start with is uh, like one uh, Bulgarian scholar, French, the, the famous French Bulgarian philosopher Tsvetan Tolerov. Uh, he has a book on the concentration camp, uh, the communist camp in Bulgaria, the Lovac. He has also a book about the moral life in concentration camps in general, but this is specifically for Bulgarian context and for the Lovac camp. And uh, Tsvetan Tolerov uh, calls uh, the concentration camps an institutional cornerstone of totalitarianism. And he claims that a society in which concentration camps are no longer conceivable cannot qualify as uh, truly totalitarian. So. Um, okay, we'll see. We'll see about that. Uh, first, some uh, short remarks on terminology. Internment, uh, like the easier one, here we will mean just indefinite detention without charge or trial. What is important to, to stress here is the extrajudicial nature of this internment. Uh, what we mean by that are people who are de facto deprived of their liberty, not based on uh, the regular judicial system, but just by uh, arbitrary administrative uh, decision. And the concentration camp, now it's a very fiery term, a very debatable, and it's not my uh, intention to create some cheap sensationalism here. Uh, by concentration camp here, I use the term by one of the specialists, uh, one of the leading authorities is Dan Stone. So it's a enclosed site used to hold against their will and without due legal process, a group of civilians deemed unwanted by a regime. So um, uh, the, the point being here that uh, it's not um, concentration camp here will not imply that these were Nazi camps. 
Uh, internment camp is also quite, quite a, a relevant term. Labor camp for some of them. So I will use concentration camp as a technical term and umbrella term for extrajudicial detention uh, center. That's it. Uh, okay. We'll speak about two forms of internment that, are, uh, that, that, that existed during the First World War, which was the starting period of, of this phenomenon on a global scale, and they were very uh, relevant for uh, Bulgaria. Also, uh, one of this is, of course, detention in a behind barbed wire or under strict surveillance in a camp. The second about internment is uh, confinement in designated areas with relative freedom of movement and choice of accommodation. So these were usually small villages or uh, or small towns uh, where people were um, uh, deported there, uh, and uh, um, they were uh, we can call this or forced residents or internal exiles. They could not leave this space uh, and have to sign usually in the local police department uh, two or three times uh, per day. So two forms of uh, of internment. Okay, uh, what what is usually <clears throat> considered now uh, the starting point is the First World War. Uh, uh, here we have a, like a growing number of research in, in the last years, actually in the last couple uh, of years, uh, truly global histories of, of uh, civilian internment in the First World War. And uh, this very much uh, that uh, is also the, the Bulgarian case. And uh, just one uh, short remark, uh, First World War, we have a new um, paradigm uh, suggest, proposed some by 10 years ago, uh, like by, uh, by Robert Gerwart uh, and scholars uh, uh, here uh, talking about longer First World War or Greater War, which means not just 1914, 1918, but we can start with the Italo-Turkish War of 1911 uh, through the Balkan Wars and finish somewhere around 1922, 1923 with the end of the Greco-Turkish War and the Treaty of Lausanne. So it's a whole war decade which really, really uh, shocked and uh, transformed, uh, transformed the world. So uh, with um, um, during the Balkan Wars now, I have uh, some hints that internment deportation existed, but they still need to be tested. But during the First World War, uh, during Bulgarian century, uh, um, uh, in the First World War, which started uh, in, in the autumn of 1915, from the very beginning, policy of deportation from occupied territories started. Now, the huge majority, and we are talking about tens of thousands of civilians here, uh, in Bulgarian case, were not enemy, enemy aliens in the legal sense of the word, which is foreign nationals uh, on the territory of a hostile state. We are talking about uh, civilians deported from the occupied territories, or uh, in very uh, simple words, Serbs and Greeks. These were men, uh, the main uh, nationalities that were uh, deported to Bulgaria and interned into camps. So uh, what you see, um, in front of you is uh, ordered by the Bulgaria, uh, by the general uh, headquarters in uh, December 19, uh, 1911. And here we can see how military captivity and civilian, uh, civilian captivity really uh, um, uh, were intermixed. So uh, the order says, in order to deprive the population of the occupied Serbian lands of any opportunity to show any hostile acts or to cause disturbances in the lands occupied by Bulgaria, these are to be treated as prisoners of war and sent into the interior of the kingdom. All male Serbs from 18 to 50 years of military age. Uh, all soldiers who have recovered from wounds, all slightly injured, and number four is all priests, teachers, former officers, MPs or deputies, journalists, ministers, and all suspicious persons, regardless of age. So the policy of uh, mass civilian deportations and internment into camps from the occupied territory to Bulgaria started uh, in the autumn uh, of uh, 1915. This was the first wave of, of uh, deportations of civilians, and it ended like some several months later in February and March uh, 1916, when uh, Bulgarian authorities thought that uh, the, what they considered to be a threat was uh, neutralized. However, uh, however uh, in February uh, 1917, an armed uprising um, broke out in uh, Bulgarian occupied Serbia. And uh, this was followed by a second wave of, uh, re of uh, mass deportations. So to illustrate that, uh, I can uh, give you just a short text from one uh, 
uh, order of the Bulgarian occupation authorities from the summer of 1917. This second wave, uh, the logic, uh, the rationale behind it was very much part, uh, part of uh, Bulgarian counter resurgency uh, strategies. How, uh, how the Bulgarian military authorities thought they could cope with an armed uprising. And uh, the, te the text is very, very simple in a military fashion, and it uh, says, whoever takes up arms to oppose the established order or is a member of an armed band is to be considered bandit and is to be shot on the spot, his property confiscated for the benefit of the treasury and his family in turn. Now, this policy, which started in 1917, uh, uh, ended only uh, as late as the Bulgarian occupation ended in September, October, um, early October 1918, um, the next year. So Serbs were the first and the foremost uh, group of civilians that were deported from Bulgarian occupied uh, territories. The second were Greeks. And uh, here, what I'm, uh, what I'm about to cite is um, a quote from a Bulgarian army report of, 19, uh, of 1919. Uh, the, the, um, the bulk of the mass deportation in Greece started in the summer of uh, 1917 when um, uh, Greek forces under Eleftherios uh, Venizelos uh, openly joined the uh, Antant. So uh, the report says that the general he uh, headquarters ordered that all Greeks officials and more intelligent citizens were to be interned in Bulgaria with the exception of the medical personnel. This measure was subsequently extended to all suspicious persons who did not fall into the category of intelligent persons ordering the internment of all men between the ages of 18 and 50. And 50 sorry. So, which means that in the uh, Bulgarian occupied regions of Greece, which is uh, uh, the regions of uh, the towns of Ceres, Drama and Kavala, almost all Greek males between 18 and 50 were deported uh, to camps in uh, Bulgaria. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, these people were uh, as you can see from this text, were uh, no, regardless of the fact that they were civilians, were considered of, uh, uh, as prisoners of war. They were uh, put into uh, camps together with the, uh, with the prisoners of war, women and children uh, included. Uh, the camps were called depots. This was the official. Uh, this was the official term uh, of the camps, uh, depots. But the term concentration camps was also already uh, in use. Uh, so after they were sent to the camps. Uh, they were like um, they they were formed uh, labor groups called labor detachments, and they were sent to perform forced labor in a variety of locations, whatever whatever the need dictated. So we can really uh, see how the tr the first total war of the twentieth uh, century um, really transformed the military and uh, civilian uh, captivity. This was the start. This was the start. Of mass deportations of camps and militarized forced labor. And he, uh, here I'm giving you uh, some quotes of the prisoners of war and internees regulations. So prisoners of war are distributed to depots which bear the names of the cities in which or next to which they are located. So there was Sofia depot, Plovdiv depot, Varna, uh, sorry, Sliven depot, etc., etc. Internees are treated in the same way as prisoners of war. There is a special text on uh, women and children. Interned women and children are treated in the same way as interned men, being also used in work according to their condition. So everyone had to work. Women, children, no matter, they were put uh, in this uh, total, total human mobilization of uh, working force in Bulgaria. Uh, the idea being that the internees are to be placed in completely separate depots and it's forbidden to mix them with prisoners of war. However, up to this point, uh, I was not able to find such separation. So uh, it means that it, uh, it, it seems that it remained a dead letter. They were intermixed, women, uh, children, men, civilians, prisoners of war in the same, in the same depots. However, there were separate compartments, usually for, uh, for women and, and children. Uh, okay. Uh, about the conditions, now this is a still an ongoing project, but uh, generally they seem to be quite, quite bad. Uh, here I'm giving a quote from um, one of, uh, actually the only report of the International Red Cross, and this report actually not that bad, but even in this, even in this report, uh, you can find the following text, uh, what, what, what the, um, uh, this commission of the International Red Cross noticed in six, only six Bulgarian camps. To come back 
to the civilian internees. Their number greatly increased following the rather important insurrection which took place in the month of March 1917 in the regions of Serbia occupied by Bulgarian troops, especially in the vicinity of Nish, as well as partial revolts which were not yet fully completed when we were in Sofia in May. As a result of the popular uprisings and the repressions which followed them, numerous villages were set on fire and entire unfortunate populations, old men, women, children, were transported to Bulgaria. We met in all these camps, um, we visited many Serbian civilian internees of both sexes and of all ages from an eight-day-old child, which means a newly born child in the camp, who had just been born in the Filipovo camp, to an old woman of 90 years, uh, old who um, ended her sad life there, having at least the supreme consolation of dying surrounded by a part of her family. Uh, so uh, this was like this was a situation that uh, the report of the International Red Cross uh, noticed in 1917 and made uh, certain recommendations to Bulgarian uh, government to improve the plight of the of the um, civilian deportees uh, from Serbia to to uh, Bulgaria. Now the number of internees uh, for this period uh, I have some let's put them total numbers that they're very problematic but at least after the war during the accusation of committed uh, violations of international law Bulgarian authorities tried to compile uh, some uh, some total numbers so the Serbs were uh, almost 35,000 and these were these are uh, only uh, the civilian attorneys that were alive at the end of the war and Greeks were something like 13,000 uh, the death, the number of deaths, uh, like uh, according to official Bulgarian data, is something like almost 6,000 civilian Serbs, not counting prisoners of war here. Almost 6,000 civilian Serbs died in Bulgarian um, internment, and uh, almost 2,000 Greeks died. Um, so uh, the First World War, being uh, the, the largest and by, by any means and by any data that we have so far, the deadliest period of uh, mass internment and camps in Bulgaria, far more deadly from what we know so far about the communist camps, so let's say, just like 10 times higher or something like that. Uh, and here are the, uh, the, the number of deaths, I tried to put it as simple, uh, simple as possible. Uh, so here uh, we, an, an important question arises, the, the cause of death. Uh, the cause of this mass death is like this combination uh, of, as you can see from, uh, from this uh, quote from a Bulgarian army report, is a combination uh, from really poor uh, nutrition, very bad food, exhaustive forced labor, and total medical neglect, which means that most of the people died uh, not, not in executions, not being shot or hanged or whatsoever, they died from diseases caused by hunger, uh, very, very exhausting hard labor, and lack of medical, uh, of medical attention. And extrajudicial killings there were, but the huge number, uh, the huge number of death is, um, is really this combination uh, of, of uh, factors. And you can, you can see that in this text, uh, in this quote, it's a very apologetic in tone, but, but even in, in that you can find it in the second paragraph. Of not a large number of the prisoners who worked in the rear of the army died exhausted there, they were sent to the depots for repair, but most of them died. Um, so, yeah, even here in this uh, very, uh, very uh, schematic, bureaucratic, uh, like, uh, language, you, uh, one can understand the, the main reason of uh, death. Okay, this was um, uh, in a time of war, in a time of total war, uh, policy of internment deportations conducted uh, and organized um, by the institution of the army. What we see in the interwar period is uh, now how this policy was adopted, not necessarily, not necessarily that uh, by the police, not necessarily that the police learned from the army, quite on the contrary, uh, but driven more or less by the international context. So we have, uh, we have a, a, a new law on the administration of police from 1925, and this is, we can say, a modest beginning, but later, uh, later Bulgarian legal scholars consider this uh, uh, the, the start, the, the, the legal start of uh, extrajudicial internment, administrative internment, uh, as a um, police uh, technique in in the ter uh, not in the occupied territories, but in Bulgaria proper. So, Article 48 of the Law on the Administration of Police, 1925, uh, stipulates 
with the permission of the Minister of the Interior and Public Health, the Director of Police for the Capital and the District Governors shall in turn in new residences in the Kingdom without regard to their place of birth, those persons who are found to be engaged in um, prostitution, but also idlers who are dangerous to the order, peace and safety of the state. Now, this is in 1925. The real change, the real change began in uh, the second half of the, um, of the 1930s. Now, uh, like, Okay, for non for non specialists in Bulgarian history, uh, in 1934, a military coup d'état uh, abolished the whole uh, the whole political and party system of Bulgaria and established a non party regime, which means all party were, all parties political parties were prohibited. So for ten years there were officially no political parties in Bulgaria. It was first for a year or two a military dictatorship, and then uh, uh, it was transformed into a royal dictatorship with King Boris. Uh, on the top. So, the first of these uh, uh, texts is uh, from the decree law on the abolishment of political party organizations, uh, new version 1935, new article 9. In case of particular importance to state security, on the proposal of the Minister of the Interior and Public Health, the Council of Ministers may order the internment of persons at a place of residence under immediate military or police surveillance for a period of six months. Okay, the first step, uh, the first step was there, and the second and most important, it's a new decree law on the state police, 1937, and uh, this is very, mm, this is very important because it's reduced whole new categories of people who who may be turned not just dangerous for the uh, for the state security and public order, which means politically, uh, somehow politically dangerous persons, but also per, uh, people who are somehow considered a threat by the regime, and uh, you can see uh, you can see the text. In the first, um, uh, from A to D, um, uh, the categories are, you can see uh, really uh, these are prostitutes and homosexuals, maybe interred administrative, administratively uh, by the police, uh, pimps, um, uh, petty offenders, uh, habitual criminals, etc., etc. Uh, the, um, so uh, these categories were not present in the previous uh, in the previous law uh, on the police. And finally, again, persons dangerous to state security, state order, or public peace. Which means um, uh, here is the period of stake uh, could be uh, is six months, but it could be prolonged for another six months and for another six months. Now these de details are important because uh, the next uh, the next. Um, uh, thing we will see is uh, uh, how how the communist regime after 1944 uh, dealt with um, internment and camps, and we can see many many similarities. Uh, but before that, uh, before that, here uh, I'll be giving you just a very uh, short text from Boncho Bonchev, the book actually it's called Internment Exile from 1931. Now this guy Boncho Bonchev was the Jewish council. Uh, the, the legal advisor to the Ministry of Interior, very much the architect of, of this law from 1937. Uh, so this man knew what he was talking about. So he differenti differentiated between two types of internment. Uh, internment can be both general and special, as he calls it. General internment is in turn the internment of morally dangerous persons, the, the ones we mentioned uh, in the previous section, and the internment of politically dangerous persons. Special internment, uh, Boncho Boncho here is quite open about it and the term use is internment at, uh, in a concentration camp. So I'll jump to the next uh, section just to be able to compare uh, the legislation uh, about internment before 1944 and the legislation after that. And we can see really striking similarities. This is the notorious decree law on very crude translation of my labor educational communities for politically dangerous persons, 1945. So. Article, Article 1, persons dangerous to state order and security may be forcibly accommodated in, a, in special labor educational communities established on, at some state farms or enterprises or in certain settlements and placed under the supervision of the people's militia. The period of stay in the places specif specified in Article 1 is does not exceed six months unless it is renewed by a new recent order from the Ministry of Interior. Now here, uh, it's exactly the same actually. Uh, and very similar, but not 100% the same. Uh, it's uh, the same decree, but on non-political, uh, just on uh, general um, people who are uh, to be interned or what the, the early authoritarian regime called morally dangerous persons. So here are, uh, again, um, what categories of, of people can be uh, administratively interned without, uh, without any 
due trial or indictment. Convicted of crimes of a general nature, non-political, more than once, if they are dangerous for the order and security, prostitutes, pimps, and souteneurs, blackmailers and gamblers, beggars and idlers. So uh, here uh, we can really see continuity uh, between uh, re continuity between the authoritarian uh, regime and later the socialist or communist uh, regimes in terms of uh, the use of internment as a government technique uh, and getting rid getting rid of unwanted uh, populations. Uh, okay, going back to the Second World War, uh, what I showed to you. What I showed to you is just the the internment that was conducted under the administration of the police or the institution of the police. Uh, so this is the first institution that dealt with this Ministry of Interior. But we also had the army, uh, which um, uh, had uh, its own policy of of uh, internment. Uh, the Bureau of Temporary Labor uh, under the Public Works Ministry also conducted such, and uh, Commissariat for Jewish Affairs. These two institutions dealt specifically with internment. Uh, of Jews uh, in Bulgaria under the anti-Jewish uh, anti-Jewish legislation, Bulgaria's participation uh, in the Holocaust. We have interned persons or, and entire families actually from Bulgaria uh, proper as a way to curb uh, guerrilla resistance or like a anti-partisan or counter-guerrilla measures, counter-resurgence measures. Uh, so the families of suspected uh, partisans were deported from one place to the other. And again, we had deported civilians from the occupied territories. So it's, the internment was much, much, um, meant much, much more than just the Ministry of uh, Interior. And I hope, I hope to be within uh, the time frames. So um, I hope like in the discussion, I'll be able to clarify some uh, more things. Civilian internment camps obviously transcend political regimes. And here it is the, uh, the, the huge role that World War one play uh, in, in this process. It was the starting point of mass civilian internment concentration camps and militarized forced labor in Bulgaria as in Europe in general. Um, if we have uh, like a more general look, not, not just specifically concentrate on, a speci uh, on, on just one period designated by uh, like by the political regime as usually histo uh, his like history has been as a, a university discipline has been taught in Bulgaria. Uh, we will look that uh, civilian internment and camps existed for most of the 20th century, actually. Of course, with many uh, peaks and uh, low points, with many stops and goals. Uh, and here we, can, we may ask ourselves um, um, the questions of knowledge transfer and cultural transfer uh, about continuity or the, uh, and or discontinuity. Um, it's a very... Now, it's it's a very important question in these global studies of uh, camps about the national and transnational uh, learning process. Where the idea came from? Where did the know-how come from? Uh, like exchange of uh, of personnel, uh, etc. And also, like I think I was thinking about some other uh, like knowledge transfer, which is usually not I think not very much uh, paid attention to this is institutional or trans institutional which means did the institutional police learn from the army or the other way around or uh, like um, um, did any other institution that was involved in internment learn from some other um, a Bulgarian one and the final final point to make is that uh, internment camps actually exist in a continuum of repressive uh, practices here I deliberately uh, did not include uh, labor mobilization. Uh, uh, I'm talking about forced labor only in connection to internment and camps. But if we, if we look at the total mobilization of uh, like a working force in the First World War, uh, in the Second World War, and uh, in the second half uh, of the 1940s by the communist regime, we we really find striking similarities uh, with that. And just for example, in Serbian language, there is one word for that, it's called robstvo. Uh, they didn't differentiate it between who was like uh, forcefully mobilized for labor, who was a military prisoner, who was civilian deported. They simply take the Bulgarian took him into robstvo, which means slavery, captivity. Uh, in Greek language, they have one really, I found this very interesting word, durduvakia, uh, which comes from Bulgarian trudovak or Labor conscript, Trudovakia, Durdovakia, and to, to, to the local population, they remember the, as, uh, this thing as one of the worst things. So, this was my last point that internments and caps exist in a whole continuum of repressive practices and have to be put in, in the, the proper uh, context. Okay, I, I think I'm still within time, Lynn, so thank you very much. Uh,
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin, for this really very, very interesting uh, presentation, which I think also served very well as a promotion of your forthcoming or uh, Edwin's project, whom I now invite to present his ideas for a political biography of one of the preeminent Yugoslav policymakers, Edwin. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, wonderful. And thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my book project to you. Um, unfortunately, Ulf, uh, or not, uh, it's not really about the repression. It's not no classical biography. It's, um, I would say, I, I, I'm using Rankovic as a person to describe the political states, the, the infrastructures of communist rule, and, uh, and its limitations. Um, so, what can you expect in the next 20 to 20, oh, 25 minutes? You can hear a short outline of my book project. I would like to introduce you to my main character, Alexander Rankovic. He is, he is uh, absolutely uh, the main character and the main point. Um, I will make some methodological remarks. I will say some sentences to my sources and the value of, uh, I would say, semi biographical approach. And then I show you uh, the currently existing work outline for my book. Finally, I would like to present a short case study in which you can see the intertwining of the institutionalized power of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, respectively the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, and the personalized, personalized rule of Alexander Rankovic. But I would like to start with a brief hypothesis. Um, this hypothesis states at the moment, on the one hand, that Looking at Rankovic as a central member of the political elite reveals structural problems within the closed Yugoslav political system, as in hardly any other case. On the other hand, the analysis of his behavior, action, and political scopes, but not only of him, also of his colleagues and um, of the highest level of party memberships, uh, it reveals the limitations of state and party um, political interventions in social or political matters. So we come to my short outline of the book project. Um, in Yugoslavia's political history, the question of the construction and organization of power and rule at various levels such as that of actors and institutions, has been a constant field of experimentation. And I'm very happy to see Wolfgang Höpken here, because he had uh, already said and rightly observed that Yugoslav society during the socialist period experienced, I quote, a permanent, almost manic change in the institutional order of the system. In uh, 1945, the victors had in mind the fundamental and violent change in the balance of power. Less than a generation later, at the end of the 1950s, the situation was very different. After the coming form conflict, political attention shifted to a decentralization of power structures. It dominated the, I would say, multiple change of power through reorganization at the party level. This included in the eyes of the communists associated negative side effects and, and so-called deformations. But in the end, the party was not able to create a situation stabilizing the political system. It is therefore not surprising that in the mid-1960s, after the failure of economic reforms and in the wake of an internal party crisis, in the all-powerful League of Communists of Yugoslavia, the political discourse was fundamentally dominated by questions of power and rule. So obviously, in the political institutional structure of Yugoslavia, domination and the related question of design of its pillars have always been of paramount importance. This does not only refer to the question of the political organization of the state. Questions of rule and power were also questions of the distribution of, in 
to say it in contemporary terms, social means of productions or of the influence of political networks and patronage structures at the highest and lowest levels. The distribution of costs in politics and administrations may be exemplary. It should also be added that during this period, the country underwent a fundamental social transformation that set the course for the country's future development. A dynamic interrelationship emerged between actors and institutions. Um, these are my main research fields, actors, especially Rankovic and institutions. Its complexity has not yet been fully explored. This is aggravated by the fact that the historical treatment of political and other institutions in the history of Southeastern Europe is very limited. Biographical works are also, by their very nature, actor-centered. In my case, this is countered by an approach that uses the example of Rankovic, one of Yugoslavia's most influential politicians who, among other things, built up the state security service and was regarded as the so-called guardian of the Communist Party to examine the interlocking of action discourse and institutional framework. So their aim is to analyze the interdependence of actor and institution and to document the processes of negotiation, the room for maneuver and the forces of inertia. From the perspective of a central actor, as it was Rankovic and his environment, networks, the tensions, fragility, and viability of personalized power and institutionalized rule structures can be revealed likely like nowhere, nowhere else, I would say. Uh, some ten sentences to my main character, Alexander Rankovic. He was born in, a, uh, in the village of Dražovac near Obrenovac in 1909, uh, lived until 1983. Um, and he's the center of my reflections. He was not only a member of the so-called Tito's team and the provisional party leadership from 1938 onwards. At the fifth national conference of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia in October 1940, he became an official member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, its Politburo, and the Secretariat of the Politburo. During his long career, which lasted until his overthrow in 1966, he was, among other things, Minister of the Interior from 1946 to 1953, Vice President of the Federal Executive Council for Internal Affairs between 53 and 63, Chairman of the Commission for Atomic Energy, 55 until 62, long-standing chairman of the Association of War Veterans and vice president of the Republic, 63 until 66. Tito entrusted him with organizational tasks at the federal level, and from 1942 to 66, he was formally appointed secretary of organization of the party. In addition to the numerous functions he held during his career, he built up the State Security Service, as already mentioned, founded in 1944. So Rankovic uh, was a central player within Yugoslavia's political elite and was at times considered the most influential politician within the party after Tito, especially when it came to organizational and cadre issues. Mm, now some sentences to my methodological approach. It's about power, rule, and especially institutions. The existing multipolarity, I mean actor, actors, institution, institutions, and society, gives priority to several political science and sociological concepts. For me, a special, um, special focus goes on power, rule, institution, which are also intertwined. intertwined. In my case, uh, power is defined pragmatically. It is usually a property of social relations, similar to the concept of rule, without a fixed form. 
both terms, as you know, are sometimes used interchangeably. In the case of Rankovic, the level of the exercise of power is particular important. It generally aims to control larger social contexts and frameworks for the actions of individuals or groups of individuals. It can th therefore be associated with influence and authority. And that, may, that means in the sense of official and commanding power, among other things. After the Second World War, Rankovic accumulated central positions of power and office like no other person, with the exception of Tito. However, it is only by analyzing, analyzing the triangle of relations between actor institution and society that room for maneuver, inertia, and path-dependent developments can be identified. This, in turn, makes it possible to measure the extent of supposed dogmatism and existing pragmatism. In terms of institutions, on the other hand, the focus is on those that serve to secure and stabilize power structures or provided a symbolic service of order. Embodied, that means embodied claims to validity. Uh, validity. In white Tbilisi, the Communist Party, respectively the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, comes into focus as, I quote from Sundhausen, as an initiator and organizer of national unity, of the unity of the popular masses, and as uh, initiator and organizer of the new state, the new culture, the new economy. But um, the state security organs are also a field of his investigation, as Rankovic is said to have controlled them, at least indirectly, until 1966. My sources. The main sources for such an investigation are the documents of the League of Communists that are accessible today in the archive of Yugoslavia, Archive Yugoslavia, especially the minutes of meetings, which also provide information about the dynamics, the atmosphere and opposition within the party. In order to assess the significance of the state security for the period under study, I will use and um, or use the files from the states, uh, state archives of Croatia and Slovenia, which have now been declassified. In Serbia, unfortunately, only Serbian citizens have access to these files. In addition, the unofficial un organ of the State Security Service, the journal Narodna Militia, Trinesti Mai, is also very important of ter in terms of um, its self-positioning within the Yugoslav political system. The publications of Rankovic mostly published speeches deserve uh, special attention as well. So we came now to the currently existing work outline for my book. Uh, I have to share with you now. Just a moment. So I found that also two pictures about my hero or not, about my central uh, actor, Alexander Rakovic. On, on the first uh, picture, you see him with Tito, I think 1942, three in Dervar. The second picture shows him as a politician, as a statesman. And I would now like to uh, pre uh, discuss to you the, oh, okay. My book uh, structure, or less uh, a sketch of it. I, I have these four topics, institutional constellations, fields of action, challenges of change. And the last one is 1966. And in all of these, uh, main chapters, Rankovic played a major role. Um, to point one, the institutional constella constellations, that means that we find Rankovic as the one who's guiding the uh, state security service. Uh, and so we can speak of Rankovic in Stalin's footsteps. It goes about the founding, the institutionalization, first attempts at reform of this, uh, also reform of the state security service. 
uh, until the mid uh, 1950s. Violence as an instrument of power and control is also um, a topic here. Then the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, respectively the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, their institutionalization, reforms, discourses, and first internal party resistance up to the um, nine, 7th Congress in 1958 is uh, in focus of 1B. Point two goes about the fields of action of Rankovic and the political leadership. Uh, of the Communist Party, it goes, but also about minority and religious policy, because he was involved as well in this field. It goes about the question of, um, of how to deal with cadre policy. It was also politicized at the moment, especially in the, in the end of the 1950s and in the 1960s. It goes about the shaping of social spaces, and I will he, uh, uh, use here the example of internal discussion and discussions and legislation of the people's militia, not the militia, the press, the citizenship and amnesty laws. Um, then in point three, I will go to the late 1950s and 1960s, the economic and social policy in the country. And my questions uh, relate the rigidity, flexibility of the political system, that means we have to deal with party reform approaches, but also with the breakdown of um, so-called solidarity, or, uh, often mentioned within these uh, internal discourses. It goes about so-called bureaucratism and deformations within the party, but also about inter-ethnic relations and first nationalist excesses. Um, in 3C, also a topic will be the internal party positioning and factional struggles within the party, we, uh, which we can see already in the late 1950s. Finally, in, 19, in uh, chapter four, I will discuss the fall of uh, Alexander Rankovic, um, and the transitional rule and Rankovic's so-called legacy. Um, so I'm back just a moment. So with me, uh, with legacy, uh, I mean uh, the question what was left of him or, the, or, what, or what reforms did his overthrow initiate? Now we came to, uh, to my uh, short case study. It goes about the League of Communists of Yugoslavia. The focus is on the years between, uh, between 1952, the Congress of the Sixth Congress of the Communist Party, and 1966, um, the so called Priuni Plenum, Plenum of July 1966. These stand at least for a while for a gradual and cautious, this period for a gradual and cautious liberalization, let's say, of the country. Um, the Sixth Congress of the Communist Party 1952 stands for the renaming of the party to the, to the League of Communists and for a new attribution of roles. From then on, the party no longer saw itself as a leader, Predvodnik, in state and society and under the pressure of the common conflict, rejected the view that the uh, League of Communists had to be a leader, Rukovodilac, or commander, Nared Budavac. Instead, as Rankovic explained in, the, in his speech here, the party should co contribute to the enlightenment of the masses in order to rise their so called socialist consciousness. Overall, a, a change of positioning. Position is recognizable, supported by distancing from the Communist Party of the uh, Soviet Union, but without any significant change in inner party structures. The powers of the parties, supreme organs, have not been extended, but they have not been reduced either. The existing power structures remained unchanged. Very soon, however, different ideas about the role of the party came to light, as well as the inability of the League of Communists to fulfill the goals it had set itself. 
As early as June 1953, in a circular letter to all party organizations, the Central Committee criticized the behavior of party members who would undermine the goals set and exploit existing antagonisms in order to satisfy their own, uh, I quote, local particularist department, departmental egoistic interests. Ultimately, the letter reveals the limited binding power of the party, which had to unite different political currents under its umbrella. Even the power of the center itself over the sub-centers was limited. Henceforth, the question of political unity, meaning the unchallenged power within the party, which has the ability to form a stable authoritarian rule and has the power to integrate centrifugal forces, no longer disappeared from the political agenda. The problems within the party remained. The contemporary observer, Fred Warner Neal, associated 1957 the League of Communists with an image of confusion and uncertainty. Jankovic is not far removed from this attribution when he criticized in his presentation to the plenum uh, of the Central Committee, Communi Committee, the Central Committee in March 1956. The critics were directed not only at those communists who did not meet the requirements and were conspicuous for their so called narrow minded or nationalist behavior, it was also directed at the organs of the republics in their, I quote, struggle for their own factory, rich road demands for ever higher investments. Rankovic did not see the reasons for this in the political structures, but he combined them with personal characteristics of many communists who allegedly had lost their modesty and whose discipline had declined significantly. If, on the other hand, one takes this presentation as an indicator of the ability to exercise power within the party, it seems to be slowly dwindling. Rankovic's position on this is uh, as follows. He remains an admonisher in German, I would say, Mahner, and at the same time a guarantor of the unity of the party, which stands for continuity and stability within the party. And although the structures of the political power within the League of Communists are not questions at this time, first cracks are visible. For the 1916s, meanwhile, a galloping and a perpetuating crisis situation within the party can be observed, which Rankovic ultimately fails to master. The intra-party discourses observable in 1958 conveyed stability, at least for a, few we, for a few years, before a more or less open confrontation broke out from 1962 onwards. 1958 stands for the extended meeting of the Executive Committee of the Central Committee and for the Seventh Party Congress, at which bureaucracy and statism were decisively opposed. They illustrate Rankovic's attitude and understanding of power, while at the same time shed light on his opponents. Nevertheless, Tito reflected Rankovic's understanding that the strength of the party lies in the I call communist organization. He did not call, call for structural reforms, and Rankovic's speech was characterized by the accusation of disunity among the comrades at the federal level, as well as against the subordinate republic levels or between the republics. According to him, politics must be shaped in one place in the Central Committee of the League of Communists and not in the republics. Edward Kadel, who was significantly involved in shaping the Yugoslav model of self-government and is considered as one as an opponent of Rankovic, shared Rankovic's views on the party at that time. What he warned against at the party congress, however, was statist bureaucracy and the excessive concentration of power in the hands of the state apparatus. At the same time, both actors are part of uh, Paradigmatic for the two larger, for the two large political blocks that were forming within the league, which were on the one hand advocated a concentration of power in a central state, 
um, and demanded a decentralization of means of rule. Rankovic closely linked such decentralization to the loss of political control and thus also to a weakening of the political power of the Central Committee of the Communists. The 1960s are referred to as the so-called golden years, accompanied by a flourishing of art, culture, and consumption. But after the economic upswing of the 1950s and the immense change in urban and rural areas, they also stand for an economic decline and the loss of the binding power of the party and the political system. This was expressed already in March 1962 at the enlarged meeting of the Executive Committee of the League, when several speakers sharply questioned the role of the League and thus also questioned the leading party level. Accusations revolved around amb ambiguity, inaction, disagreement, etc., to which Rankovic reacted uncreatively with the call for a better degree of organization and demanded strict adherence to hierarchical structures. Kardel was very close to this. He supported Rankovic by name, but he also differed in that he called for change in a situation in which authority of the party leadership was gradually dwindling. Two years later, when the poor economic data became entrenched and, as, and as nationalist biases within society came to light, it was Carde who, in the ex executive committee, pointed out a drastically changed mood in society as a whole and spoke of the fact that certain social developments could no longer be stopped by police means Thus, Sankovic's understanding of power from an authoritarian-led state. The League of Communists was on the verge of upheaval. The criticism of it did not stop, and the struggle for the understanding of power increased. Rankovic's reluctance in the ongoing discussion is surprising. Admittedly, he, who was perceived as the guardian of the League, more than what anyone else still enjoyed Tito's support. From then on, however, he no longer managed to set up successful influence. Instead, these came from Carter, who spoke out against the paternalistic statism at the Eight Party Congress in 1964, which also meant the League Communist, uh, the League of the Communists. Carter, from then on, took the initiative. It was not. Rankovic. Symbolic of this is, that, is uh, that the November meeting of the Executive Committee in 65, it was not Rankovic, but Kartel, who gave the closing speech in which he rejected a firm hands policy, a system imposed from above and also demanded that Tito stop centralizing everything that was not necessary. So Rankovic lost political ground, especially since he was unable to show innovative strength to prepare the League of Communists for future tasks. The fateful year of 1966 must again be seen against the background of the failure of economic reforms. At the same time, relations between Belgrade and the Republic centers intensified. International relations and the often invoked bureaucracy no longer disappeared from the agenda. The political leadership, especially Tito, had to react as the League of communists proved in, incapable of acting adequately in the crisis. Therefore, there was an internal discussion of the reorganization of the executive organ, organs of the Central Committee. Tito called here for a leadership that will have full authority. According to the author, to me, this, um, uh, this was one of the main reasons why Rankovic was ultimately fired and not an alleged influence of Rankovic on the state security apparatus for his own benefit, as can be read in the secondary literature. The League had lost its authority and prestige. It showed itself to be incapable of reform in the course of a domestic political crisis lasting several years, which is why Tito was forced I would say to remove Rankovic from power in order to preserve the League of Communists as a key organizer 
my point was that I, in my opinion, um, it was the um, um, uh, um, it was the main reasons why uh, Rankovic was ultimately fired and not an alleged had no alleged influence of on the state security. It was that he was not able to reform the, the uh, League of Communists at that moment in a, in a very deep crisis of the state. Um, so the League had lost its authority and prestige. It showed itself to be incapable in 1966 of reform in the course of a domestic political crisis lasting several years, which is why Tito was, uh, was forced, I would say, to remove Rankovic from power in order to preserve the League of Communists as a key organizer and powerful political factor. And in doing so, he re relied on the reform-minded wing within the party. I'm, I uh, will finish with a short summary. So focusing on one political body and one actor, it's the case uh, with Rankovic, inevitably leads to the neglect of other individuals and institutional in some uh, point. But as a paradigmatic example, however, it, it also has the advantage of highlighting problem areas and lines of development better than if one were to consider the so-called big picture. Rankovic, however, was more involved than almost any other Yugoslav politician in various socially relevant policy areas from the uh, Second World War until the 60s, so that this is not just the story, story of one actor. It should be also a story of the state. A few of his actions and political sco scopes reveals or should reveal the limitations of state and party political interventions in social or political matters like in hardly any other case. So thank you very much.